Welcome, everybody, to the second episode of the Big Ballin' Podcast on the Field of 68 Network. Make sure you subscribe, Field of 68 Network, to the Big Ballin' Podcast. And I'm thrilled to introduce uh, one of my idols growing up as uh, getting recruited at Tennessee and a big reason I came to Tennessee, uh, former All-American, SEC Player of the Year, our man, Ron Sylvester Slate. Yeah. <laughs> the author of the Boom Boom Room and everything else. We'll get into that later. How are you, big dog? I'm good, Dave, man. How you doing, bro? I'm good, man. I'm good. People are already calling you, I see, to get your reaction on uh, on the Tennessee game, I'm sure. But we're going to get it here first. So um, I just finished calling Tennessee's win over Cincinnati. But forget my thoughts. I want to hear what uh, the former great Vol himself thinks of the early impressions after a couple games of UT. What you seeing? And you know what, Dane, um, first and foremost, I think the, the biggest thing for people, um, not sure if everybody got to see it because it was on the, on the SEC uh, network app. And, um, but for the people that did see it, I think the, the best part of that entire game was at the end. Um, they, they panned to the Scobie talking to Keon Johnson right after the game on the court. And he was whispering something to him in his ear. And I can only imagine it, it being about, you know, the turnovers and being able to handle the pressure. And that, that right there is, man, that, that's a beautiful sight, man, knowing that the, the, the space he came into last year with Kobe um, and being thrown right into the fire, knowing this is a guy that's highly touted coming into it and knowing that there's a lot of things and a lot of responsibility on Keon. And him being a guy that's not shunning away from that and not trying to protect his spot, but bringing him along, I think that's big time, man. And that's just... I think that goes to the culture of, of what Rick Barnes and those guys have started up there. And it's, it's just spilling all the way back from the players to the trainers to the coaches, from the fans. So I think that's beautiful to see, man. But as far as the game overall, ugly game, man. But at this point, game two of the season, <laughs> you, you got to take it, man. You know what I mean? Cincinnati is a team, you know, with some transfers in and some guys that can really get going. Um, I think they, was, they had a good lift off the bench today. But – Overall, man, it, it's going to be ugly. I think the first five, six games, those guys getting out of quarantine and getting back to playing, getting used to each other, it's going to be ugly. And if you can get wins throughout. Hey. It broke up a little bit on me there, but I couldn't, I, I couldn't agree more. The, the culture is, uh, you know, that word gets overused at times, but – but it is. I mean, it's so important. And you can see it on the court with these guys. And the examples that you gave and just how they complement one another, I, I, I'm impressed at how they, they just never waver. Um, you, you can't really tell if a guy's having a good game or a bad game based on facial expressions. Their body language is terrific. Um, and, and they've got just, just a ton of weapons. Um, but I, I am – I want to talk a little about the freshmen. I know they hadn't put up any type of gaudy numbers, but, man, uh, there's sometimes you just see a couple plays by Keon Johnson that just make you say, you know what, I'm not overreacting when I say he's the real deal just by, by a couple buckets. And, and, and the way Jaden Springer gets in the lane, two foot jump stop, you know, mm -hmm. under control. And, and what I love about them too is they're, they just have that, that aggressive mentality, you know, that nobody's going to punk them. They might make some bad plays, but it, they're not backing down to anybody. At the same time, it doesn't look like they're coming in just with uh, – Hey, the new sheriff in town. I'm a big five star kid. Give me the ball and watch out. I, I agree. I agree with you, Dane. You know, watching those guys, man. I, I think the control of their body coming in as freshmen, especially yeah. not having the pre a normal preseason or a normal summer to get in there with Big Garrett and get get stronger as, as he would like them to be. I think they're doing a terrific job, man. You see, Keon, he's everything, especially defensively, that you heard he was. You know, that's his. To me, that's his calling card. I'm sorry about that, man. It's, to me, that's his calling card, man. And he, he's locking up one through three. And that, that's big time. And Jaden, with the time that he's been given early, he's what we expect to be offensively. You know, um, so I think they, they, they balance each other really well, man. It's some, it's some great, great power to come off the bench. You've been a part of teams that are deep. And having that depth coming off the bench, that's something you can't, you can't account for if you're on the opposing side. So... 
I think it's, it, it bodes well for the future, man. Well, and, and you know, nowadays, you, you better love basketball if you're playing right now. And you better be able to bring your own energy because you were a guy that brought it every single game. And it didn't matter if it was um, just five-on-five five pickup with nobody in the gym or a sold-out arena. And just watching that game where, you know, Fulkerson gets a, an alley-oop dunk and there's, there's hardly any cheers, you're not getting a chance anymore, those sort of things. It's just – it's different. And so on an early Saturday morning, nobody's making any shots. Everybody's rusty. I mean, it's real easy to start sleepwalking. And even though it was sloppy, I never saw them just, you know, give up on their, their effort. But, um, yeah, I just think it's, it's critically important that you, you just have to – as the great Pat Summit used to say, you got to be able to start your own engine. And you better be able to do that um, in today's world. So okay. impressed with those guys. But enough about, about the young bucks. I want to hear more about Ron Slay's career and and uh, and make sure all the fall fans that maybe didn't witness it or have witnessed it get a chance to go down memory lane with you. So I'm going to take you back to uh, high school in Nashville. And if you can explain the, the process, because everybody hears about prep schools and everybody knows about Oak Ridge, but not, not everybody was either good enough or have been in that position to have, go through that experience. Yeah. How's it work and how did you end up uh, at, excuse me, Oak Ridge, Oak Hill? Right, right. Well, first of all, man, it was um, I, I, in Nashville, growing up in Nashville, the first person to go there that I was familiar with was Ron Mercer. Um, Ron Mercer, his mother, shout out to his mom, Birdie. She was a MTA driver, drove the buses a lot, uh, the city buses around Nashville. My mom was on the city buses a lot. So they formed their own relationship. Um, unknown to me or Mercer, you know what I mean? So they were having conversations in the past um, without me knowing, without him knowing. And as I, as I got better and better at Pearl Cone High School, um, a friend of mine, Terry Reynolds, who was a sophomore, we were in the same grade. He left as a sophomore and went to Oak Hill Academy as a junior. His dad is more um, in the know, Big Terry. He was my coach when I was little, but he's in the know as far as the national scene is far as basketball goes and he knew about Oak Hill got Terry up there and he was telling coach Smith I got another kid uh in Nashville man he can play man I'm telling you coach was like ah okay well I take a look at him he never took a look at me it started my junior year we played in Bristol at the Arby's Classic yeah against um D.A. Lane who went to, went on to Georgia and play he played at Wheeler um from there we I think I had like 26, uh, 10, and 10. So I had a triple-double um, in the Arby's class. got the MVP of it. And just so happened, a guy, Burley Jean, rest in peace, Burley, he was a guy that always went around and looked at local talent in the region. And he went back and said something to Coach Smith. So this is the second time Coach Smith hearing about it. He was like, okay, let, let, me, let, me, let me see what's going on. So we went up there for a visit um, going into – my junior year, I broke my wrist playing football. So I was out the beginning part of the season of basketball. We took a trip there, up there. My mom, me, Coach Fitzgerald, um, and David Whitfield, Whitfield, my mentor slash uncle. So we ride up there, man, get on the curvy roads. It's, it's, it's about five hours to get up there. We get off the interstate. I tell them I got to use the bathroom. We go in this little convenience store off the interstate. And I'm asking them when I come out, like, hey, how far is Oak Hill from here? It was like, you got about an hour and a half on up the hill. I said, what? Come on, man. We just drove three and a half, four hours now. Man, we get on up there in the curvy roads, dang, man, pull up. It's a, it, it was like um, God sneezed and, and sneezed this little bitty gym, turned the gymnasium right here in the pasture. <laughs> you turn, and nothing else around. You turn left, go up the hill, and there it is sitting right there, man. It's no bigger than Pratt Pavilion has been. You wow. know what I'm saying? So it is a small place. You walk in, you got to duck to go in. So once I go in, Coach Smith comes out, meets me, goes in the office, talks to my mom. I'm in the um, gym shooting around with the assistant coach. My right arm is in the cast. So I'm shooting with my left about 15 feet, making everything, dang. <laughs> like, <laughs> I was blessed. <laughs> I never really worked on my left but until then, but, boy, I was making everything. So – Coach Stoneman, who was the assistant coach that was in there passing me the ball, was like, man, you want to do a couple of drills? I was, I'm thinking to myself, no, nah, man, I made about 10. I don't want to mess this up. I'm cool. <laughs> so my mom and Coach Smith, you know, come back out. Coach Smith asked Coach Stoneman, hey, man, what you think about him? 
He's like, Coach, if he can shoot with his right hand like he can with his left, we might got something. You know what I mean? So they took me on a tour of the campus, and I met the players, met some of the teachers. Left there, um, and when I on the way back to Nashville, my first instinct was, it ain't no way. Really? Like, yeah, this was a wasted trip. Ain't no way I'm coming up. Like, I love all this. You know, you, you're, you're, you're amazed by the, the jerseys, the stack house, and McGinnis, yeah. and the staples, the list goes on and on. Just because it's so isolated and just nothing? Yeah, man. I'm like, no. Nah. And then you got to imagine, you've been, you've been from Tennessee. You work hard to get that Mr. Basketball, man. Yeah, even that's right. I'm, yeah. Even if I'm runner-up, even if yeah. I'm winning, just put me in the running of it. Right. I'm not leaving Nashville, not when I done, I done made my bones here and I get to be Mr. Basketball. Nah, I'm cool. I'm cool. So it was a struggle, man. I had to have some talks all through the year, man. And then finally, Coach Fitzgerald pulled me to the side at the end of the season. And I was like, man, listen, um, your friend's still going to be here, man. When you get back, it's going to be like God pressing pause, man. I promise you, as soon as you get back, Everything's gonna be exactly like you remembered. I was like, man, I ain't trying to do it, man. He was like, trust me. So I was like, all right, I'm, I'm gonna try it out. I got up there and shoot, man, I went to summer school and that's a whole different story. They tricked me, Coach Smith. <laughs> and I don't let them down about that. They tricked me and got me up that day and talked about Nike camp. They're like, oh, man, we got you the end on Nike camp. You know, you get to go to Adidas camp, but you know, I'm, I'm in plugged in. Cool, let's do it. Man, I get up there, man, I'm going to summer school. Six days out the week, Dane, by myself. Eight to four, Monday through Friday. Uh, eight to 12 on Saturday. Man, it was, it was wild, but best experience. Getting, getting those hours in, man. That, so that's interesting, though, because, like, sometimes I, I feel bad for the high school or the high school coach when their best player, you know, goes for greener pastures. But, but in your case, it was encouraged. Yeah, yeah, it definitely was. Um, and it was more so – um, me not really understanding the national landscape. You know, I, I, all I knew was, of course, I played AU, um, made it to the nationals and all of that. But still, to me, in the state of Tennessee, Memphis, you being from there, that's the epitome of basketball. You know, if you can get mentioned with those guys, you know, you're on your way to do something. And we were starting to be, Nashville was starting to be mentioned with Memphis a little bit. So I was like, cool, man. I, I want to lay this foundation to have them continue talking about it. So I didn't, I didn't feel like I needed to go to Oak Hill to play against better competition. I just need to go down the street. play against. Well, the some of these, but some of these prep schools, and you alluded to it, middle of nowhere, sometimes mm -hmm. intentionally, or summer school. And a lot of times it can be, hey, uh, good player, good kid, just need to get him out of this environment, keep his head straight and all that, um, which I think has a lot of positives. And you're you're a work hard, play hard guy, right? So, I, but 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 my concern is, in, in hindsight, is all right. Well, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna put this guy up in up in Oak Hill for a year, yeah. and uh, but man, when it's time to go on those recruiting visits, I gotta imagine you're gonna make the most out of those opportunities. So, t take me on a few of your recruiting visits, uh, not just Tennessee, but where all you went, and uh, maybe not. Uh, everybody knows you ended up choosing Tennessee. Right. But uh, where was maybe the best recruiting experience or a couple Dang, stories? Let me tell you this, Dane. Um, going to Oak Hill Academy, best thing to change, best thing ever that could change my life. I went up there and had a, I had no, I had no idea what the core G PA and whatever I'm, I'm stacking in math, I can make it up in PE. Or, you know what I mean? I can right. substitute to do what I got to do and plug and go. I went up there, man, with a 1.6, dang. So, first of all, before we even get to the recruiting, I don't make it to college. <laughs> Not because I was a bad student or anything. I just had no idea in the public school system about your core grades. I just need to be eligible to play on Tuesday and Friday. That's it. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So, going up there gave me a whole different structure. I got on my grades and did the right things. Before I went to Oak Hill Academy, um, David Cutcliffe, and I tell him this story all the time, David Cutcliffe comes walking through the gymnasium at Pearl Cone High School going to go recruit John Henderson, who was my teammate. Um, he was the number one player in the nation at the time in football, top 10 in basketball. He's going through the gym with Coach Fitzgerald to go into the football room, and I'm out there playing pickup, and I'm going bananas out there. <laughs> it's just like in the game. You know, I'm dunking this, that, and the other. Cutcliffe 
And I'm getting on the phone. They got to get out of here and see him. Next day, started getting calls from um, Coach Ferg and uh, the likes of Jerry Green. And I was like, man, okay, well, um, my mom kind of committed me herself. <laughs> so I verbally committed going into my senior year to Tennessee um, before I even got to Oak Hill. So I get up there to Oak Hill. I'm in the middle of nowhere. I've been up there all summer. The fall comes around, you can start taking visits, right? I've already verbally committed. Coach Smith is a coach that's going to make you stand on your word, regardless, because right. people come up there, he don't want to be the guy influencing you to go other places. Yeah. Cool, coach. No problem. Steve Blake's going to Maryland. He got Gary Williams up there. Travis Watson's going to Virginia. He got Pete Gillen up there. Uh, Cliff Hawkins being recruited by Tubby Smith from Kentucky. They fresh off the national championship. I'm up there two weeks. Nobody's been there to see me. I go tell Coach Smith, hey, Coach, nope, this ain't going to work. Let's open this commitment. Right, that's over with. Let's open this recruiting. <laughs> They're going on visits. Steve just went to UCLA. He telling me what they're doing in L.A. I'm up here at Oak Hill with these khakis on and this little tight shirt. Man, this ain't going to work. I got to get out of here, man. He's like, no, Slay Dog. You can't do it, Slay Dog. I can't open it up for you. I said, Coach, man, they ain't even came up here to see me, man. Like, tell me and everybody up here, I know I'm, I'm, I'm the leader on this team. It's already been – it's a yeah. stack. And I got some great teammates with me, but I'm the leader on this team. I got to be recruited like <laughs> You know what I mean? I need them five visits. So he was like, man, go back to the dorm, think about it. Um, the next morning, Coach Ferg was up there. Late on, <laughs> I bet he was. <laughs> late on that week, Coach Green was up there. And I don't know how many times they're supposed to be able to come, but I know in the two-week span, they came four times. So I don't know <laughs> if they broke the rules or what, but that's neither here nor there. So I say all that to say, man, once they came back into the fold and start pushing, Dane, I, I, ne I never went on any visits, man. Wow. I never went on any visit. It broke yeah. my heart, man. And I, was, I wanted to go to Arkansas. I grew up an Arkansas fan, Nolan Richardson. Um, I wanted to go to Kentucky once I got there. And me and Cliff Hawkins became really cool. I wanted to go there to Kentucky to play with him. Um, wanted to go to Virginia with, with Travis. You know, yeah. Travis took my number 35. We had a, a different type of bond. So he was 35 in Virginia. I was 35 in Tennessee. But we Coach played. Ferg and them knew, hey, if we win Mama, we win Ron. And hey, hey, they knew it. They hey, killed they got a little bit of that in common. You know, I, I really never took another visit besides Tennessee. I, I was an early commit to them. They were the first to kind of recruit me the first day, Coach Ferg. And, and I didn't grow up a big Tennessee fan. I didn't, didn't hate Tennessee, but it just uh, – it was it was a loyalty thing, so uh, that, that that's funny. Let me, let me take this little thing, thing before we go any further. Yeah. Now I now I went on two visits. My two visits were to both to Tennessee. The first yeah. time I went down there was a whole team went, a whole Oak Hill team went. It just so happened to be the 1998 game versus Florida, and we beat them at uh, at UT. Ran on the field, carried the goalpost. So right then. Now, let me tell you, I told him when we was riding back on the van, hey, Coach, you can call him tomorrow and tell him I'm ready to sign. It's, yeah. a, it's a done deal. That atmosphere right there, that changed my whole perspective, man. I loved it at first, but that changed. Well, well two, two takeaways there for me. One, I had no idea that David Cutcliffe was the guy that started your recruitment. Yes. And God bless David Cutcliffe. Oh, man, Cut. <laughs> As if he needed any more accolades and, and uh, increase the uh, status of his reputation. But thank exactly. you, Cutcliffe. But number two, I don't know that – I mean, people realize it, but I don't think they realize how much of a real impact it is. We, especially at SEC school, when you're hosting these guys on visits, and you and I have hosted plenty of recruits in our time. We've been hosted. Right. Man, when the football team loses that game and the strip is dead, oh. you've got to put your selling shoes on, man, because it's hard to paint that vision of, hey, man, normally this strip is packed, and normally they're doing this, and normally – man, it's uh, – it's, it's tough man. stuff. That's facts, Dane. But who, who was, who was uh, hosting you on your visit? Anybody that uh, – Dane, I, listen, man, I can't draw this stuff up, man. Um, so I knew pretty much everybody on the basketball team um, by playing against them or uh, yeah. knowing them just because this was at a time like when you were there, it was, it was really driven by the Tennessee talent, you know what I mean, how right. good the team would be. So Vincent Yarbrough, Dale Baker, Charles Hathaway, C.J. Black, knew all these guys, man. Isaiah Victor, Tony Harris, 
the list goes on and on. Um, they get me up there and they put me with Charles Hathaway because Big Hat's from Nashville. Yeah. I tell Big Hat when I get to the room, hey, uh, Big Way, I don't know what you got planned for me, man, but I'm 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 kind of like you were. I'm, I'm like you were. I'm I'm gonna go do my thing, man. Yeah. <laughs> he was like, cool, let's do it. Mind you, Buck Fitzgerald, who played with me at Pearl Cone, is already up there on the football team. John Henderson, Reggie Ridley, all these guys are from my school and are on the football team. I'm going to hang with the football team. You know what I mean? So I go over there and hang with them. I walk in the room with uh John. I'm in there with John. It's me, John. Sean Ellis, Big Cat, salute the Big Cat. We're all sitting in their apartment. And then Al Wilson and Ray Knock walk in. So I'm sitting there. I know who these guys are. I'm like, golly. <laughs> I'm in here with some dogs, man. They can really go pro, you know what I mean? I'm seeing how it's working. I'm like, this is all right with me. This is all right with me. So they, um, they turn around, and Al and Ray Knock, they get ready to walk out. We tell them we're going to meet up later. And before I walk out, he was like, um, I don't know who told Al this. And I tell Al to this day, I don't know who told you my name. But he turned around and he was like, hey, hey, Slay, make sure you, um, you get with us a little later. I, who? <laughs> Are you, Al Wilson? Al, Al Wilson, you talking to me by name? Don't you worry, brother. I'm going to make sure I'm wherever you tell me. <laughs> hey, I'm ready to run through a wall, man, just because they know my name. So I, I – that's that's you're trying to play it cool, like uh, every five minutes you want to be like, where's Al at? But uh, let, me, let me just play it cool. Let me, let me wait till later. <laughs> hey, man, that stamp be solidified it, Dane. It was over. I didn't need, no, I didn't need to see anything else. But I, I do remember um, after that, man, I was like, I'm, I'm with the football. And I stayed with the football team the entire time. I remember Coach Ferg called me and was like, Hey, you want to come down and eat breakfast with the coaches? I'm like, hey, man, I'm over at Sid Wilson house, coach. I ain't, <laughs> I ain't going to be able to make it. <laughs> I mean, he was like, oh, don't worry about the slate dog. So, <laughs> hey, man, I stayed with the football team, and, and I tell everybody, hey, listen, you have not. Telling Admiral, Grant, all them guys, Jordan Bone, dude, you have not experienced the University of Tennessee until you're winning, the women are winning, and the football team is winning. Totally different. Like you can be good in basketball. Yeah. Women can be doing their thing. If football is winning, you can bring anybody up there. They're committing, dang. It's a fact. Man, isn't that isn't that the truth? I mean, it, it I couldn't say it better, man. And it's uh and, and they were, you know, when I was there, they they were you know, it, it was up and down a little bit. You could tell it wasn't the, the consistency maybe that 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 you had, but it's a whole I didn't realize that. I knew you were always really close with the football team. I didn't realize it was because you and John Henderson being high school teammates, kind of, kind of the end there. But you're right. Like, if, if you can have that, what, what I don't think should be understated, though, is, is you've got to have some of your best athletes on campus kind of connecting all those teams together. You mentioned Grant Williams. Like, Grant was in, in a different way. He's going to all the soccer games, volleyball all right. games, all these things. But, you know, when, when Ron Slay and John Henderson are hanging out, like, because it can get into a jealousy thing if, if there's right. not some cohesion there. There really can be. Right. But uh, it, when it's clicking, man, and everybody's rooting for each other, it, it's, it's powerful. And, yeah. uh, it's and it makes it a lot easier when everybody's winning. So do it. <laughs> so, yeah. it so, so you get to Tennessee um, and uh, start off terrific. Um, remind everybody and myself kind of, I mean, who you, what that roster was. And, uh, and and what your role was? You were six man coming out of the gates, right? Am I correct? No, um, we we jumped in with man. My recruiting class. We came in with five guys. We had uh, Harris Walker uh, from Chattanooga Brain, who went to Hargrave Military Academy for uh, one year, yeah. but he was Mr. Basketball. You had Terrence Wood, Terrence Will, Terrence Woods coming what? from Treadwell. He was Mr. Basketball. Then you had me on um, the year before being runner up to Vincent Yarbrough. Uh, my junior year, and then getting the Oak Hill, being a national champion, going undefeated. And then you got John Higgins coming from Shaker Heights, Ohio, a steady guard, you know what I mean, with a steady hand that uh, was, in a sense, the glue to that, 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 that group. Then you got Marcus Hayslip, who was the, the ace in the hole. Yeah. Um, I remember us going to uh, the Kentucky Derby in Louisville, and Slip was undecided. And I was telling them, man, I, Coach Ferguson, they – 
I know we don't pay players, but they should have gave me something under the table for getting slipped, man, because I personally got slipped out, man. He was ready to go to Kentucky or Louisville, man, and I was telling them, like, dude, they ain't showing us no love up here. Look, they showing all the love to Reese Gaines, the Joe Johnson. Dude, man, I rock with your boy, man. You know what I mean? <laughs> Slip came on and committed after that Kentucky Derby game, and, and he was the – he was the one that put us over, put us over the hump. So we come into it, man, with that roster that we got, and we had all upperclassmen. You know, what I mean, Isaiah Victor was established, C.J. Black, Charles Hathaway. This is only in the front court. Then you add me and Slip to the front court. Then you come back and look at the guards. You got Tony Harris, who's all SEC. Vincent Yarbrough, who's all American at the time. Dale Baker, Vegas Davis. Um, it was loaded, man. And so, it like, in, in all respect to Rick Barnes's teams, Coach right. Pearl's teams, Conzo Martin teams. Right. Man, I know I don't have to convince you. If it's just a straight pickup game, the, oh, the talent on those Jerry Green teams was right. second to none. But you've got to entertain us, though, because, you know, the, the, the rumors and the legend is just y'all had all this talent, all these players. When it came to practice, it was just – Throwing the ball out there as if it was just a self-run practice and scrimming. I mean, I mean, is that is that an exaggeration or like really walk me through? Because we're used to the discipline. Like, show up here, get your ankles taped by this time. We're gonna film by this time. We're gonna stretch. We're gonna get into fundamentals. Then we're gonna do the scout. What was the agenda <laughs> under Coach Jerry Green? Man, I'm gonna tell you what, man. I don't think he knew the talent that he was. Yeah. Stockpiling. At a, in a sense. I think, you know, as a coach, you try to get seven or eight guys you can depend on to have a foundation, and you got that. Here he is. He gets 11 or 12 guys deep at any position and can play it anywhere in the country. Um, I, so I think he had something to build on coming off the NCAA tournament uh, year, and then he gets us all of a sudden. So we were a different bunch. Um, we were a very competitive bunch that wanted to get to it at all times. And it played well a little bit. Now, did we lack discipline? Without a doubt. And discipline in the sense of having direction. Mm -hmm. That's what we lacked. Um, but as far as, hey, man, we getting at them, we were setting the standard. Come out in the first half, Coach Green had to do no talking. He, all, all we needed was whichever coach was going to do the scouting report. Get that scouting report together. We're going to go over and in practice. We're going to take this guy out of it. We're going to take this guy out of it. And they got to beat us with their third guy. We're setting as a team a standard. We're only giving up 20 points in the first half. I don't care who we playing, Florida, Auburn, with Chris Porter, those guys, 20 points in the first half. That's all we're giving up. And we did it like on six different occasions, man. Gave up 20, 22 points. You could beat anybody. That's great. There. That's great, but don't dodge my question. Did you guys even practice? I know what you want to get to, Dan. <laughs> I'm going to give it to you, man. We walked out there, SEC play started. We on the roll. And we talk and jump in the film room. Yeah. Hey, man, well, man, forget all that. Because you, you, put a, you, put the, you put the practice plan up, and they have it listed, orange and white. Who's on the orange team? Who's on the white yeah. team that day? So I'm looking at it. I'm like, man, coach got, coach got all the freshmen. Oh, he got us on the white. Oh, okay. Well, so we're going against the – hey, man, we don't even need to talk no more. So we talking. We can't get through no film or anything. So Coach Green had enough of it. All right, that's it. That's it, guys. Come on, everybody, everybody out, everybody out. So we, everybody go out there. We still talking. We like, all right, let's get to it. He said, you guys want to do what you want to do? All right. And he rolled the ball out there and said, let's go shirts and skins. And we went shirts and skins to start SEC play. Man. <laughs> and got after it. They had to call to practice. We probably scrimmaged for 20 minutes. But we, it was so heated, dang. Like, I hey, mean, but you know what? I, I kind of like that, though. Like, as, as, as much of a reputation he had as not being disciplined, like, if yeah. guys want to go at each other's throat, hey, there's been a lot worse practices out there that had a steady agenda, and you got guys going through the motions, not even competing. But if you guys, you know, have that type of competition in the locker room, then, then screw it. Just have and, an old-fashioned search of skin. I'm not saying do it every day before every opponent. but right. <laughs> That's what it was, though, man. He – he let us set the stage. So whoever was a starter, it's no way. I dare you to go through the motions in practice. And he yeah. knew this. The assistants knew this. I wish you would go through the, through the motions in practice because we were – I was outspoken enough to call whoever it was out. Oh, Tony, hey, Harris, go get his spot. Talking to Harris Walker. Go get Tony's spot, man. So Tony better turn it back up. I'm pushing Isaiah Victor. Same thing for Hathaway, Black, Slip, 
everybody, man. So it was, it was very competitive, man. But I think down the stretch, um, going into that, uh, we had a great team. A lot of plays, great team, um, bonding moments, and um, some good winning. But to lose against North Carolina, I think um, that's where the direction of the discipline came back in the wee moments of the game. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Like, we had a terrific game plan and stuck to that game plan. And that game plan worked. If Brandon Haywood doesn't foul out of that game against North Carolina, CJ Black doesn't foul him out, we win that game by 10 or more. Wow. If he fouled out of the game, that took their number one offensive uh, um, guy that they were going to, and it made Ed Coda get the ball in his hands, who was a fifth-year guy at the time, and he was a wizard, man. He had, yeah. Guthrie didn't he, he didn't even coach he, uh, Guthridge. You know, he didn't even have to coach him, man. He let Eric Coda go out there do his thing, set guys up, and, and we, we kind of went downhill the last two three minutes. But you know, some of that uh, you know, there's a lot of positives there, and that that not a lot of teams have these days. And some of that's just everybody being too nice to each other. I'm not trying to sound like the the old head, the veteran, <laughs> but I mean. You you talk trash in practice to to your own team, you know. I mean, but it was it never got. I mean, it was personal. Mm -hmm. But afterwards, you take a shower in the locker room, and go get something to eat. Yeah. But as far as with the opponent, t take me back to somebody because you talk plenty of trash, and the fans love to talk it back to you. Love to engage, and one of the most entertaining athletes ever in the SEC. Yeah. Can you remember a player that you just got in his head so bad, men that you just. Nene. Dressed him down and took his confidence away, and you just murdered him. Nene. I have a picture hang up on my wall in my man cave. Um, uh, and they got me doing this, and I, I, I'm talking, and what I'm saying is, I'm, I'm in his head. I got him. I'm in his head. Yeah. And I remember the exact moment Auburn came in. They were defending champions of the SEC. They came back. Chris Porter returned. Enjai had returned. They had Doc Robinson. Um, What's what's my guy? Um, it works with you guys. Um, I'm talking about Fishback. Fishback. They had Damon Fishback. Damon Fishback even had some hair. Uh, yeah. And they had a, they had a really really good team. Pullman, Scotty Pullman could shoot the ball really well, and they were coming into it, and we needed to make a statement. Um, we were getting a lot of acclaim. I was getting hyped up a lot, and I used to find one guy that I could take out every game, and it was Chris Porter this time. So I'm like. I got to get Chris Porter. If I get him talking to me, we got them. And Chris Porter came down and missed a shot. Once he missed that shot, it was just a, a, lead, a little hook shot. Once he missed that shot, I talked to him the entire way up the court. Refs had the separators. And when they separated us, I, walk, I turned around and walked to the bench. And, <laughs> and Chris Porter was still standing there. As soon as the ref walked away, I ran back up on him. Yeah, I'm still here. He can't stop me. He can't stop me. Then they came and pushed me away. That's when I was doing it. I'm in his head. I'm in. And the crowd, Thompson Bowling, went bananas. From that point, I think we went on like a 20 to 2 run, dog. Counts that game. And they were top 10 at the time. So that was a good game, a measuring stick for us to see where we were. And we ended up spanking. But you had, you know, it's one thing to talk trash after you're playing well. You decided to do it out of the gates. I mean, it takes some balls to go to the other team's best player. And, and, and yeah, you had the crowd behind you, but you would do this on the road, too. Oh, yeah. So it didn't matter where you were. But oh, to do it because of strategically coming out of the gates of, hey, I'm getting somebody off their game today, and I'm going to do it right away. I don't care if I go 0 for 10, but I'm going to get in somebody's head. And that was the thing, Dane. Like, I used to go into games looking for – I used to love coming off the bench, especially coming – like, everybody wants to start, but to me – Coming off the bench, you get to analyze the game and see exactly what the team's missing. And you get yep. to bring that to the game. My thing was, man, who can, can I go rebound? Is our energy dead as far as communicating? Like, I did it in my own way. And me being able to score, that was just a bonus. You know what I'm saying? But my thing was to go out there, get somebody out the game and pick this energy up, not only on our team, but around the whole, uh, the whole arena also. So... That's what I focused on, and that's why I think I had so much success. I wasn't coming into the game saying, man, I got to score two or three baskets and get going. No, I ain't got to score a basket. I just got to get out here and get to talking. And I'm uh, this is this, this podcast about you, but I'll, I'll share some of, little of my strategy. I didn't come out of the gates with it like you did. I didn't come with it strategically. But when the opportunity presented itself, it, and what I would do is just try to take away 
uh, I, I was like rabbit in eight mile. You know, I had to take away what they were going to say and be like, you know, if they said something, I'm like, man, let me tell you something. You and I both better get our passports ready. Your ass ain't going to the NBA. I'll see you in Denmark. I hope your passport's not expired. But the thing that I love to do, I, I loved it when there was like offense for defense substitutions at the end of the game. And I'd be like, oh, man, dang, coach is taking you out. He doesn't think you can – oh, he doesn't think you're tough enough to fit. Oh, here comes the offense for defense. So I'll get him out, you know. <laughs> so, man, that, that was some of the oh, most – Oh, dang, dang. That would ir- – listen to me. As a trash talker, that would irritate the hell out of me. If you did that to me, <laughs> I'd tell coach, hey, man, nah, you got to nah, – no, do not take me out, dog. I got to get him. He but, you, me, I gotta get him. Like, if it's me and you, and let's say you, obviously you would be the better player, and I'm just there to try to defend you as best I can. And if I got you struggling, I'm sitting there saying at the free throw line, like, man, you know your boys are texting back home, like, damn, Ron can't score on the little white dude. How's he ever going to make And I'm like, man, I heard there were some scouts here. I heard there's some scouts, and you can't score on 6'3 slow white kid. Yeah, once, you, once you hit them with the truth, then it gets yeah, personal. Then they're little. like, then they're like, damn, that wasn't even trash. To, he didn't even say anything. Mean. He said something like that was factual. Like it ain't I, nothing like <laughs> it ain't nothing like. I'm gonna tell you what, man. Chuck Hayes. I got Chuck Hayes. Chuck Hayes is a guy that never really talks, man. Go yeah. out, blue collar, blue collar guy, get the job done, man. I I came into Rupp Arena, Dane. I mean, from the get go, and I happen to be hitting. Yeah. We're probably down by about six or eight points, but I am talking. Y'all better not let me get this ball. I'm dropping them off step backs and everything. And I remember I pulled up from about the K in the logo in the middle of a uh, rock. And before the ball went in, I said, <laughs> I told Chuck Hayes, that's a jawbreaker. And smacked him on the butt. Then it dropped in. He, said, <laughs> he looked at Tubman Smith and said, hey, coach, what you want me to do? He talking to me, making shot. Ain't nothing I can do. I said, oh, yes. They have no idea. <laughs> that did it for me. We can lose this game. I, that did it for me. I'm fine. <laughs> I did my job. So. I love when they start talking back to their coaches, man. That, that, that's something. But what is it like, you know, because of some of the trash talks? I don't know. You know, some people blame it on AU and everybody being more familiar. But, like, man, it just – you know, I, I've got all the respect in the world for the opponent. Like, Chuck Hayes is somebody you, – like, you're saying that stuff too, but after the game, you're going to give them some dab, give them love, all that. And it just seems like now when you watch kids on the court, Everything's so friendly, even if it's your best, your greatest rival. I'm like, man, forget trying to make sure that you're cool with the other team's best player. You know, like, uh, you got to go at their throats, man. I'm not saying be disrespectful, get a tech, but it just right. – it, it doesn't seem personal enough at times. You, you know what, Dane? I blame a lot of that, not on AU, but I blame it on stuff like social media. Um, mm-hmm. Because if Dane's in North Carolina and I'm in Texas, um, the only time we're going to get to know each other is if we cross paths and, and change numbers or we're, in, we're on the AAU circuit quite a bit, but even st- yet and still, I don't know you. You know what I mean? When I play you, we got something to get down about. You know what I mean? I'm trying to be better than you. You're trying to be better than me. So it's not me after we play. I'm going on social media. Hey, Dane, that was a good game, man. You right. know what, man? You a good game. That was a good game with you, GOAT. Put the little gold emoji. No, dog. No, that, that ain't what it's about, man. I got to get out here. I remember playing Kentucky and going up to there after I shoot around. I went to their hotel, kicked it with Bogans and 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 uh, Cliff because those, those are my friends. You know what I mean? But they know. Yeah. As soon as we step inside this box, no, man. Keith Bogans got a scar to this day. I remember I used to never cut my nails for when it was a jump ball. <laughs> Anytime it was a jump ball, I was not going to try to get the ball. I was going to put my arms around the ball and dig into your skin and cut you. Keith Bogan's got a slash right here on the inside of his rib and right here on his arm over his tattoo because of me. He was like, come on, Slay, what you doing, man? I'm like, hey, dude, like, you know it. You know what it is, man. You my dog. I love you, but we're going to war out here, man. Ain't no friends. You know what I mean? Just the other guys I'm with. So. Yeah, that's, that's a problem, man. It's too friendly, man. But I, I, I think that's a good thing we get to see from a guy like Keon Johnson. Yeah. We're still friends with him. That aggressiveness. You know what I mean? EJ Adams yeah. brings that to this team also. So I, I, like, I like that I like that, that mentality they have, especially Ease. Ease, I don't know. You won't know if Ease don't know um, the English language. Is he a cyborg? <laughs> you ain't got a clue. But one thing you better know, you better not get in front of him in that realm. I'll tell you that. Right. 
Yeah, yeah they, they play hard enough. Even if they're not trash talking, I'll give them credit for playing yeah. hard, man. I, like I, don't know if, talking, I don't know if anybody did it as good as you. And you went through the coaching change, and you still managed to be an All-American and, and SEC Player of the Year. Um, you know, if you can just – well, we don't have much time left, but kind of take us through your, your senior year because – me watching you and, and the impact you had, because even though Buzz's tenure didn't last as long as he wanted it to, the, the, the promise that your team showed is what got guys like me and others and C.J. Watson to commit to Tennessee. And, I, I, you know, back in when PlayStation still had the NCAA tournament game, I'm playing with Ron Slay on the game, and my parents were watching Ron Slay carry the team. It, it had to be a thrill to have that green light to where you could pull up from the tee uh, on the logo, and you could take whatever shot you wanted um, and, and just had a remarkable senior year. What do you remember about it the most? You know what, man? I, the the biggest memory was going into that senior year, me tearing my ACL and um, going yeah. into the summer and them clearing me to, um, to start back playing. I just remember, man, and, um, a big thing for student athletes was, to me, a big thing was being able to go down to Alabama and go to the uh, – the, the the SEC media day SEC media day yeah, yeah. That, was, that was big time you know and uh I didn't I, I got to go my junior year tore my ACL got to go my senior year and remember everybody leaving me off of the all SEC teams mm -hmm. so I'm thinking now wait a minute this this don't make sense my my freshman year I'm six man of the year by Dick Vitale that's cool second year my sophomore year I'm third team all SEC coming off the bench. That's cool. Junior year, me, Vince, and Slip coming in the SEC play all averaging 20. I tear my ACL, and y'all telling me y'all forgot about everything? <laughs> now, wait a minute. Now, y'all could have put me on third team, honorable mention. Y'all just left me off everything. So, man, that fueled me going into my senior yeah. year. Buzz didn't have to do anything. Like, I'm going to talk to the team before. I'm going to have us ready, and I'm going to leave, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk it. So, and I'm going to back it up, and I'm going to stand on it. If we have a hard time, I'm going to stand on that. Good times, we get to the team. But I'm one that's going to take the bullet first. And I think that was my mentality going into the season. The preseason was the best time to me. Going through the preseason workouts, getting back into it. I made Big Rod um, change it. You know, you have to run those 300-yard shuttles. And he would split it up and have the guards going and the bigs, and everybody have separate times. I made him change it. Now, we all got one time. You know what I mean? Like, even if we don't make it as big, if we just come close, right? that's pushing. That's going to make the guards push it. So it started from now, man, and it's us coming together as a unit. And I think the biggest thing was having guys rely on you. You know what I mean? And you answering the bell yeah. every time they need you to answer the bell. You know, it was um, some fun times playing against Chris Bosch, um, going into SEC play, um, a, a shootout with Reuben Douglas in the preseason when he was in New Mexico, um, then getting an SEC play, winning, um, getting the accolades and, and the team relying on me, and also seeing the guys have success as a C.J. Watson. I remember telling C.J., hey, man, listen, it's before the season started, Dane. You want to lead this league in assists? Just give me the ball, C.J., I got you. I promise you. <laughs> and C.J. went on to lead the SEC in assists. I'm telling him, man, like, dude, just get me the rock, you know, and – that was Ron, big. Ron Slay, I think you're going to get reincarnated in, into this world as a wide receiver, just a diva wide receiver. Just get me the damn ball. Throw that's, it up. That's all you got to do, man. You'll see what happens. But, man, those were some fun times, man. And um, uh, uh, the, the downer to that entire season was at the end when, when my guy John Higgins was rude and eligible going into the SEC. Uh -huh. tournament. That, I think that derailed a lot of the hard work that we did leading up to the season. Um, and going through so that. remind everybody, because I remember, man, I mean, you guys were, were in the NCAA, well, projected in the NCAA tournament. Started to slide towards the end of the year, and you were on the bubble, but still should have been in. Yep. But then when you're starting, well, your starting guard gets ruled academically ineligible, whether they admit that they took that into account or not, you know they did. Exactly. I mean, you had a tired. watch party, too, right? Yeah, we, I mean, were was, tired. we were tired at 9-7. and 9-7 and seven in the SEC usually gets you in, you know what yeah. I mean? Like, uh, granted, we lost the last two or three games, uh, one senior night against Mississippi State. We had a really good team, Roger Jackson, Derek Zimmerman, Tim Bowers. They had a mob. So we ended up beating them, which got us ready to go in the SEC tournament. All we need to do probably is one game to solidify it, and we would have did that. We ended yeah. up playing Auburn, Marquise Daniels, 
Um, those guys were loaded. Um, but we found out the day before. And with them removing a, a, a guard that's been a four-year starter, a senior, um, always in the top 10 in the SEC in three-point shooting and in the nation also, you take – and him, him losing it, we get in the tournament. It's a different, it's a different day. We yeah. get in the NCAA tournament. We we go. I promise we go on a magical run because I wasn't gonna let us go down. The yeah. same well, run that Auburn went on with Marquise Daniels. That's the same run yeah. we had. So yeah, I believe. Yeah, and I'm, I'm, I'm. Day happened, but I'm also thrilled that a competitor like you at least got to experience the NCAA tournament because my career was backwards. We didn't make it, and I was always disappointed. But once we did make it. And you got a taste of Selection Sunday and being part of the NCAA tournament. I was like, man, I feel so bad for any teammate that didn't get to experience this. I mean, it's 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 like nothing else, man. It, it's it's a phenomenal experience. So we'll see how deep of a run this year's Tennessee team can can make it. Any any parting words for the for the ball faithful before I let you go? Man, you know what, man? Uh, stick with them, man. Stick stick with uh, stick with our guys, man. Um, Coach Barnes is doing a, a hell of a job, man. His coaching staff with the addition of Kim English now, you know, stepping in for where Rob Lanier um, stepped out with Coach Swartz, Coach Oliver, man. The list goes on and on. I think those guys do a fantastic job, man. It's something you can hang your hat on. And the culture that they've created and these players are, are, are running with and keeping it, um, keeping it alive, you know, and exactly what Coach Barnes – um, um, wants to get out of his players. You, uh, I don't think you see that scowl as much as you did the first two or three years from Coach Barnes because it's already into it's already into the team. Like it's no That's stability no, and consistency. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's incredible. It's yeah. no looking over the shoulders no more about the point guards. They know exactly what was happening. They mess up, they can really just run onto the bench because they know it's over. So I think that's a good thing, man. But um, fans, man, it, it, we make it through this COVID. I think we're gonna have a special NCAA run. And um, the state stay locked in with them. Well, th this was too fun, man. There, you got too many stories. We're gonna have to you do a second. Part two and a part three. They ain't bring me back. I know we we gotta get a second episode. We'll do it. It'll be by popular demand. So for everybody out there that'll be listening, uh, the Field of Sixty Eight Network, subscribe to the Big Volin Podcast. This is episode two with the great, the one and only, the legend Ron Slay. Ron, thanks for everything you've done for me, Vol Nation, man. and uh, and for still being such a huge part of the Tennessee family. No doubt. I love you, Dane, man. My guy. Likewise, man. Take care. Thanks again. Yeah.